बन There we go. So anyways, I'm Amy Solera. I'm the community engagement manager here at Apraxy Kids. And I have Abby Dillon with us today that walked in the 2023 Cleveland Walk for Apraxia on Stratton for Sienna, her Apraxia star. And their team had raised over $5,000 and were a grand champion team. So I just wanted to talk to you today, Abby, about that and some other things about your Apraxia journey. Uh, well, Sienna's Apraxia journey and um, go from there. Okay. All right. Sounds good. Excellent. Well, can you, first of all, share a brief recap about your journey of supporting your loved one with childhood Apraxia speech and maybe a little timeline or diagnosis until now kind of thing? Of course. So um, I have two daughters. Uh, one, my, my oldest daughter, Blake, just turned six, and then Sienna is four. So Blake was about uh, two-ish when Sienna was born, and Blake was speaking in two to four-word sentences, like understanding her extremely well. So like that was kind of my frame of reference on what talking should sound like at, at that age. So as Sienna grew up, I kind of noticed she was a lot quieter than her older sister. And, you know, people were like, that's normal. Um, you know, the, the older ones talk for the younger ones. And, you know, my, my mom senses were tingling. I was like, I don't, I don't think she's talking the way that she should or as much as she should. Um, so I talked to her pediatrician about it at, at around 15 months. And her pediatrician's like, you know, it doesn't hurt to get a early intervention evaluation. Like, um, there's a program called Help Me Grow. I think it's called Bright Beginnings now uh, for the state of Ohio, which is a free service that they'll do evaluations for speech, occupational therapy, things like that. Um, so my her pediatrician put in a referral. I talked to them when Sienna was about 15 months and they're like, even they were like, it's early. 15 months is like right on the like she could be a late talker, you know, they're, they're giving me all of these reasons why I sh shouldn't worry about it right now. Um, they're like, if she doesn't start talking in a couple of months, let's revisit this at 18 months. Sure enough, you know, 18 month old Sienna rolls around and um, she's not talking. She's not saying words, she's not mumbling, she's not doing anything, she's just a quiet kid. So, uh, we had the evaluation and at this point it was in the midst of COVID. I think it was, um, 2021, like mid 2021. So we weren't yeah. still like vaccines were still coming out. Like we still, it was a lot, a lot of things were still closed down. So, um, she had to do this evaluation on zoom. And if you can imagine how effective, uh, zoom evaluation is for an 18 month old, like I was certain, like we weren't going to get anything out of it or, anything. So they did the evaluation and they determined, yep, she's behind on speech from what they could tell. Everything else was, you know, on pace for her age, but yeah, definitely behind on speech. So they're like, we'll get her a speech therapist and like, she'll catch up in no time. Um, so they put us with an occupational therapist at first, mm -hmm. which I wasn't sure why they chose that route, but it was still like, a she wasn't making much progress. And then as we got with, a uh, therapist that specialized in speech, Sienna started to make more sounds and they, they weren't, they're more word approximations, yeah. but she was starting to use her voice a little bit more. And that was around two, two and a half. Um, and then at three years old, you age out of that program for the state. And then they put, they put you in with your um, school district. So um, as she was about to age out of that program she was about uh so she's Sienna's sitting over there she smiled at me um uh, as she was about to age over at that program she had about 20 ish word approximations but it was more of like did she say that I think she might say that it was a lot more of like guesswork um and that's when her speech therapist uh had mentioned apraxia and I remember that moment like it was yesterday we were in our kitchen and she had mentioned it and I just I started to cry because it was a relief that somebody now believes me that this is not just, she's not just a late talker. Like, and, but then at the same time, it was an overwhelming sense of, okay, now we have this diagnosis. 
what, what does that look like? What does her future look like selfishly? What does my future look like? Our future look like? Um, so it was an overwhelming uh, moment to say the least. Um, and that was like right when she turned three um, and she was pretty close to nonverbal at three. Like she would say sounds, but nothing that was like, oh yeah, this is what she's telling me. Mm -hmm. And then after we got the tentative apraxia diagnosis, um, you know, my husband and I, we did what we do best. We went online, we researched, we found apraxia kids. We found therapists that specialize in childhood apraxia speech. And um, she's for about a year now been in speech therapy four or five times a week. And she, uh, I'm happy report is speaking in two to three word sentences. And now we're working on making sure that you can understand her rather than getting her to say the words. Mm -hmm. um, and she's using them a lot more spontaneously, which is, can be a challenge for kiddos with apraxia. Um, and like her receptive language has blown up. And I think that was part of, um, you know, she's a COVID baby. She's born in December of 19. So her entire life was spent inside these four walls. And so now that she's in preschool and she's starting to get around kids and families and things are starting to normalize again, um, she, her receptive language is exploding. She understands, she talks with her sister. Um, so uh, it's, it's definitely had its ups and downs, but um, we're, we're getting there. We're, she's talking. Wonderful. And now I'm sitting here listening to your story and my 11 year old Praxia star is my second child. And I can relate to your, almost your whole timeline. <laughs> um, and same thing with the early intervention services um, here in Pennsylvania. We don't go to the schools at age three. They graduate out of early and go to a program called DART, which supports preschool age kids. And then once they're done at preschool and go off to elementary, then the, the elementary school picks up around here. So, but it was very similar to your story. I can completely relate what you're going through in a lot of ways. Um, so why is it important for you to spread awareness? Um, well, first of all, before um, I had a child with apraxia, I had never heard of it. And before we got the diagnosis, I remember spending a lot of nights, you know, Googling things. And I was like, you know, my toddler is like searching for words or it looks like they can't find the words that they're looking for. And then like apraxia kept coming up in my research. And I was like, I didn't want to admit it because I read that apraxia is something that the child has their entire life. And I was like, no, no, no. Like those, everybody's saying that she'll grow out of this um, speech delay. So like, I didn't want to admit it. Um, so like, that's why I want to raise awareness because um, people should know about it. There, there's a million versions of what normal speech looks like or normal communication looks like and I just I have a hard time like when I first got when she first got diagnosed I remember thinking like people would ask her questions because they think a, a three-year-old can answer them and I would just answer for her and then you know is like I, I stopped doing that I explained to them she has a speech disorder. She knows what you're asking. She doesn't know how to say the answer. And like, that's why I want to spread awareness, to make it a little bit more normal that people don't assume like, I'm just going to go up to a three-year-old and know how to answer. And there's so many different variations of what is like where people are in their learning path, a proxy or not. And uh, that it's just, it's important to me that people know that like I don't when she first got diagnosed um, and she wouldn't answer people especially outside of our home um, I didn't want to say that she was nonverbal because she's not and people in general when they hear nonverbal they shouldn't they think that there's 
a level of intellectual disability attached to that. And that's not always the case. So I didn't want to say that she was nonverbal and then people kind of like tilt their head and get like, she's, she's very smart. Mm-hmm. And there's no, she has no developmental delays. She just, the words in her head come out sounding like gibberish. There's no other way to explain it. And like, I just want people to know that, that she's trying her hardest, like just give her a minute, like she'll get there. I, I can, um, yes, I, I, I would have to say that one of the biggest things my child has taught me is to be patient, um, that there are a million different ways to communicate. And not that I didn't realize that before, but I think that you grow and also to give people grace because unfortunately that's the only way sometimes you can through it is because otherwise you'll go crazy (laughs) is you have to give them a little grace in order to keep your own sanity and understand that you might have been there not you in general a general you might have been there at one time and not understood and it would have been helpful someone might have explained it a little bit to you or gave you some grace Mm -hmm. um but and my son has taught me that in so many other areas of life too, when it comes to school and work and homework and all that stuff too. It's probably one, been one of my biggest lessons and I appreciate that from him over these years. Um, let's flip it over a little bit about walk though, because you did do this big thing. You raised all this money. I mean, you were the walk coordinator too in Cleveland this past year as well. So you've done a lot of things already. Um, tell us though about your walk team. Tell us about Stratton for Sienna and who walked with you at the Walk for Apraxia? Um, the team was made up of my brothers, my sister-in-law, my niece, nephews, um, my parents, and our friends. And uh, I, I don't know how many people in total were, were there, but it had to be upwards of 15 or 20 people that walked for um, Sienna. So it was such a huge thing to see like we knew we had a strong support system but to see it you know in the flesh that everybody walking for for our girl was was uh really nice to see it is it's it's so fun for the child to see it too my we've we've walked seven years for in honor of our son on his team and uh some years we have more people than others and that's okay um But it's always, it's kind of like his birthday. It's a very special day for him. And he realizes that and he always looks forward to it. Um, What methods did you use to fundraise and become a grand champion member? I just, um, I just talk to people. Like I, I like to talk to people. I have no problems like going up and just, you know, sharing this information with people. Um, You know, as my biggest piece of advice, I think for, people who are fundraising get get comfortable with the uncomfortable like it's always an awkward conversation to ask people for money you know especially if it's somebody that you're close with and you're like hey we're fundraising for something that my kid's going to need fundraising for every year like can you donate and it can get uncomfortable but I just remembered and Jenna and kids like her like they're uncomfortable every day like, just imagine knowing what you want to say, going up to a line and like they, somebody asks you a question and you say the words and then they can't understand you. And like, that is, that's incredibly uncomfortable. Like I was on a meeting the other day that I was facilitating and for the life of me, I couldn't pronounce the word ambiguous correctly. Mm-hmm. Like, and then I stumbled and I'm facilitating to a, um, Zoom full of 40 people, 45 people. And there's me trying to say ambiguity or ambiguous. And I was stumbling and, and it's just, you know, crickets on the other end. And I'm like, oh my God, like I was starting to get embarrassed. And like, that's one word that I stumbled over. That's their everyday life. And if you can just take a fraction of that uncomfortableness and use it to be like, they're uncomfortable all day. I can be uncomfortable for a 15 minute conversation to ask somebody to support my kids, my kid and kids like her, it's the least that we can do. It's, you know, we're a fraction of the stuff that they have to go through. Uh, if, if that's the least I can do for her. That's a very valid, 
Very, very valid point. And I use that description very often that you just use when I talk to people about childhood apraxia of speech. You know, think about a time when you're stumbling over your words and it's really frustrating for you. And now think about my child going through that 24 hours a day for the rest of their life. Right. <laughs> That's, it really puts things into perspective. Um, great point and, and um, great description. Thank you for sharing that. So now what, what specific message of hope do you have to share? What would you like to tell others that are on the journey supporting a loved one with a child, childhood apraxia of speech? To probably realize that it's not a linear journey. Um, I think that's sometimes the hardest part is, um, you know, she'll have a string of really great days. She's talking, she's using the words correctly. You can understand what she says. And then the next like three or four days, she reverts back. She's not saying them the same way. And I don't know if it's because of the apraxia, but like regressions feel a lot, like all kids go through regressions, but regressions feel so much more heavy for like in my mind for Sienna, because I'm like, is it a normal kid regression or is it something with the apraxia? Is she going to lose what she already knows? And like those days feel a lot heavier. But as you're going through these, this journey, I would just say, remember that it's not linear. You're going to go three steps ahead for one step back. You're going to go, you know, across the street and then it's going to go back. And there's going to be days where you feel like you're not moving the needle at all on progress. And it's just like, why am I doing this? Why am I putting her through six hours of therapy every week? And, you know, my older daughter gets to do dance and extracurriculars and, and Sienna's extracurriculars are speech therapy. Like, why are we doing this? It's not making any sort of difference. And it's like, it just sinks you down. And then all of a sudden one day, it's like, it starts to like work and you see it. Um, but then, you know, you'll have a bad day or she'll have a bad day. And it's just, it's so back and forth. And I think if you go that, if you know that going in, that it's not going to be diagnosis to perfect speech, like in this straight line, it's a lot easier to process because you can tell yourself, look, this is a bad day. We all have bad days. And I think we forget that with um, kids with a proxy or kids in general that have any sort of difficulties in learning or life or what have you that they have bad days too I mean there's days where Sienna does not want to participate in therapy and I think to myself like she's never going to get this this is I don't know why we're doing this and it's like how many times have you woken up and you're like look I don't want to work today I don't want to do this like I don't want to answer these emails I just I woke up on the wrong side of the bed I just want to do nothing and it's like, why are we entitled to have those days? But our kids can't. So just try to remember that they're just like us. They're normal kids. Um, you know, my six-year-old who is, you know, neurotypical, there's days where I have to beg her to do her homework or beg her to do anything besides get off the couch and, you know, play Roblox. Like, I think... It, everything feels so much more dire with kids with apraxia because you know what uphill battle they're facing. But like you said earlier, like give them some grace. Like it's totally fine if they don't want to go to therapy one day. It's not going to be every single day. Right. You know, um, the journey is, there's a lot of ups and downs and a lot of back and forth. So I think you, if you remember that, it kind of releases a little bit of that tension of we're never going to get to the end. Like, nope, just accept today was a day where you don't want to do anything. Again, a very amazing and valid point and really great advice to give to other people that might be on the same part of the journey as you, maybe getting getting into it now and learning about their child's diagnosis or even in the future. I mean, again, my child's 11 and it's I need to hear these things still sometimes. And I really appreciate that. Anything else you'd like to share? I just want to say thank you to you guys and, and raising awareness for apraxia and um, like the things that you put on your website, like speech therapists that are specializing in apraxia. One of Sienna's therapists I did find from your website. 
So it, it was a great resource and it was uh, a lot of comfort, especially when the prognosis for apraxia is different per kid. Like you, there's a general idea of like what support you can give, but it's really based on, on the child themselves. So like that unknown piece can be overwhelming. So having all of these resources allows me and my husband and our family to feel like we're contrib contributing to that prognosis. Like we're giving her all of the tools necessary to succeed. So we're doing the best that we can based on a situation I can't change. That's a, again, a really a wonderful way to, to put it, especially with, with the resources that are available. Um, you know, one of them, the IEP roadmap that just came out, you know, not even a year ago yet. Um, I utilized it my first time, obviously, um, on my son's IEP this year. And the significant help that it gave me to make some really powerful changes in his IEP was so amazing. Um, and there's so much more to come and I'm so excited for it. And it's going to be some good things. So um, you're early in the journey still, and I hope that you can continue to find a lot of use for the resources that will be coming and that have come out and through your journey, because even though things change, you'll need to kind of circle back around to some of that stuff and it'll make sense later. Um, if it doesn't make sense now, but, um, thank you so much for everything, Abby. I'm like so blown away and almost on the verge of tears here. Oh yeah. Well, thank you for reaching out and, um, I can talk about Sienna all day long. So. <laughs> Uh, I'm happy to share. And, you know, I think that's another thing that people often forget is, about disabilities in general is these people are, are normal people. They're normal kids. And like, she likes to jump on the bed, annoy her sister, ride her bike. Like she's a normal four-year-old girl that just struggles with speech. It's just one part of who she is. Um, you know, so being able to talk about it freely, laugh about the challenges that we have, instead of trying to like struggle and cry through them, it's a, uh, it's humanizing right. to talk about, you know, this is just one piece of who Sienna is. Um, you know, there's one piece of who I am or my daughter Blake is like, so being able to just talk about it and realize that she's a normal girl. Mm -hmm. and, and getting her the tools that we can to talk as closely to being able to be understood. Um, it's just really great. I'm going to turn off. That's a lot.